revenue. Uh, please call the roll. Senator Carroll. Here. Senator Caslin. Senator Douglas. Here. Senator Gibbons. Senator Forky Kerr. Senator McGarvey. Senator Meredith. Present. Senator Nemes. Present. Senator Webb. Senator West. Representative Beckler. Representative Bentley. Representative Blanton. Here. Representative Bridges. Here. Representative Dossett. Present. Representative Fisher. Representative Fleming. Present. Representative Flood. Representative Fugit. Here. Representative Gentry. Here. Representative Hale. Uh, present. Representative Hart. Here. Representative Hatton. Representative McCool. Here. Representative Nemes. Here. Representative Palumbo. Here. Representative Gibbons Prunty. Here. Representative Raymond. Here. Representative Reed. Here. Representative Riley. Here. Representative Santoro. Here. Representative Tipton. Here. Representative Wilner. Here. Co Chair McDaniel. Here. Chair Petrie. Here. We have a quorum. We'll entertain a motion on the minutes. So moved. I have a motion, a second. I have a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Minutes are adopted. Up first on the agenda, we have Kentucky's Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Deployment Program. And I think we were expecting John Moore, KYTC Assistant Highway Engineer, and Justin Harrod, Electric Vehicle Project Manager. Hello. If you will, introduce yourselves for the record. Uh, John Moore, Deputy State Highway Engineer for Project Delivery and Preservation. And Justin Harrod with KYTC. Planning, Navy Program, Electric Vehicle Project Manager. Very good. Will you raise your right hands? Do you swear firmly to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. And then, uh, if you will, please give a brief overview. And I know you have a presentation. We're going to try to get questions in, so I may speed you along at times. But if you can just give a brief overview, and I think we've got some questions. Okay. Thank Very you. Very good. Uh, just give you a, an update of where things stand. Uh, we'll share the, the major highlights of the uh, uh, NAVI plan. NAVI stands for National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure uh, Plan. Um, <clears throat> just to start out to, to share with you, uh, the, the vision out of the, the plan is for a reliable, accessible, convenient, and affordable EV charging network that supports transportation choices, energy diversification, economic development, and environmental sustainability for all Kentuckians. Will you make sure that your microphone is on the bright green and it is sufficiently close to you, please? Thank you. Yes, sir. Sorry about that. Uh, first, I uh, wanted to share what our what we've designated as our high-priority EV coordinated cor corridors. Um, this includes all of the interstates and parkways, and uh, we've added to that some uh, specific uh, highways to help fill in the gaps to ensure accessibility throughout uh, Kentucky for uh, electric vehicles. Uh, as part of that, we had to designate a, an alternative fuels corridor. And the, all, these alternative fuel corridors is limited to our interstates and parkways. And there's some, uh, some criteria associated with that that I'll get into in just a minute. Um, so. Uh, this came about about a year ago with the uh, I IJA, the Federal Transportation Reauthorization. Out of that, uh, developed the National Electric uh, Vehicle Infrastructure, or NEVI, program. The NEVI program consists of two blocks of funding. The first is the formula funds, $69.5 million that is uh, scheduled to come to Kentucky. And then the discretionary competitive grant program, uh, $2.5 billion available uh, nationally. We don't have guidance on that yet, but it's expected later this year. So one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, criteria for accessing these funds is to have a, an infrastructure, an EV infrastructure deployment plan. And I'm happy to report that uh, as of September 14th, uh, Kentucky was one of the first and with glowing uh, uh, reviews from the feds that we got our plan approved. And that releases the first 25 million of uh, NEVI federal funding uh, which we're uh, working now to uh, to deploy. <clears throat> so, uh, 
So how we're looking to deploy those funds, uh, we've broken it up into four phases. Phase one and two, we're working on now to deploy those. Phase three and four uh, requires uh, that the alternative fuels corridor be fully built out. And I'll share just, a, just in a moment what that build out looks like. And we expect that to be um, uh, fiscally related, uh, about half of 2024's uh, NEVI related funding to get that fully, uh, fully built out. So as a reminder, uh, this is the AFC quarter that we have to build out in order to move off of this network to uh, fill out the, the balance of the network. What does build, build out mean? Uh, it requires uh, NEVI chargers, DCF, DCFC, this is uh, fast charging stations, at least every 50 miles, limited to uh, a mile from the corridor itself. And at each station, it's required to have four 150 kilowatt chargers for a total of 600 uh, kilowatt. And these are required to be open to any comer that has an uh, electric vehicle. It cannot be proprietary. Currently, Tesla is a proprietary uh, charger. So uh, until they open those up to the rest of the market, those would not be considered NEVI compliant. Um, the, the framework that we're proposing to put in is that KYTC will not own, operate, or maintain these stations. We're facilitating the deployment of these funds, and these would be uh, uh, fully uh, deployed in the private sector. As such, we're uh, providing information based on the suitability, whether it has the, the basic components that's required to uh, sustain a, uh, a uh, basically those that would be marketable, how marketable would be, they be at these uh, locations, and then priority, how it relates to a successful deployment, a successful build out of the AFC network. So we're providing those information for, uh, for applicants uh, to help guide their investments. Uh, a common question we get is the, the charging station costs. Uh, the capital cost, the upfront cost is uh, between 800,000 and 1.2 million per station. And this is for a full Navy station of four ports. Uh, of course, it's all custom based on the specific site that uh, a, uh, an applicant is interested in based on the power that's there, any site configurations or uh, nuances beyond that. Based on our designated AFC, we estimate the full build out would be about $40 million. And I will caveat that, that uh, this is a, uh, a somewhat nebulous number right now. I'll get into that in just a second. Operating and maintenance costs, we're still uh, uh, working on what that uh, year over year cost is going to be. Uh, there's not a, uh, not a good firm number on that. Um, and then the, the last point uh, relates to the, the cost is there's a tremendous amount of market volatility uh, affecting both capital and operating and maintenance costs. And so we're, uh, once these start getting deployed, both in Kentucky and in other states, we'll firm those numbers up significantly moving forward. Uh, back in uh, August and uh, through the month of uh, September and October, we issued a request for information to the industry and other interested parties to basically help us inform both our uh, uh, upcoming RFP as well as other O&M uh, considerations as we deploy these chargers. Um, uh, Justin has been heading that up for, for the transportation and he spent the, the vast majority of October uh, conducting those meetings and gathering information. Out of that, we had uh, 36 uh, responses through a variety of market categories and we're, we're still getting uh, some responses and we're still following up on those in order to get the best deployment we can out of, out of these funds. So uh, finally, wanna share with you what our, uh, what our schedule is gonna be. As of right now, we're transitioning into November. Uh, we're right on the end of uh, holding those uh, RFI meetings still have some that uh, we anticipate uh, coming up, but over the next month or, or two, we're gonna be developing those procurement documents to get those out. Our goal is to have a draft of those out in December for market awareness with the, uh, uh, with the proposals due back at the end of February, early March, and have contracts issued uh, in that time frame. So uh, with that, open to any questions y'all might have uh, about this program. Appreciate it, uh, thank you very much. Um, Representative Tipton, you have a question or a comment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
I know this is new for a lot of people. And one question that I get a lot is, uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming we're looking at things, uh, businesses like service stations, restaurants that are close to that corridor for potential. Who actually, does the customer pay for the electricity that's used? How will that be handled? Generally speaking, the, the, uh, the, the retail atmosphere we envision is that there will be a, a fee for that uh, charge, just like you pay for electricity at home. Um, un unless there's a, an entity, entity that throws it in as part of those, but uh, we anticipate a lot of these will be standalone, maybe associated with a business, but we'll stand alone and charge a fee for, for charging. Mr. Chairman, if I could make a brief comment. Please. Uh, right now, an individual who's from out of state who drives in, uh, purchases gasoline in the state, they pay a user fee on that gasoline that helps pay for upkeep of our roads. Uh, we've just made changes in the law for mm -hmm. residents of Kentucky who own electric vehicles uh, to pay into that. However, somebody from out of state who has an electric vehicle, uh, they come in their state, they use their roads, uh, they charge in their state. I'm assuming there's, at, at right now there's no mechanism for them to pay any kind of user fee for the use of our roads, is there? I'm not aware of one, no, sir. All right. Mr. Chairman, that was for your benefit. Thank you very much. Representative Prunty, question or comment? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'm from Western Kentucky, and I've stopped at the service area there at um, Hartford Beaver Dam. There's already okay. charging stations there. How does that fit into the to the network? And there were diesel. They were fueled by diesel. I mean, it, it makes no sense to me. Can you comment on that and, and how they would fit into the network? Those are, uh, my understanding is those are Tesla chargers, and so they're not uh, eligible for uh, all electric vehicles. So um, there is discussions, or there's, there's a word that Tesla is looking to open those up to all electric vehicles. And if they do that, then uh, that transition uh, could be NEVI, uh, uh, NEVI eligible for funding. But uh, until that is uh, open to all chargers and it doesn't really fit into the uh, to the build out at all currently. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Nemus, Thank question you, or comment? Question, Mr. Chairman. So my question is, I guess, to go to the fundamentals, you said these are going to be associated with a business who will get a benefit. The manufacturer of the car gets a benefit. The driver gets a benefit. So why is the taxpayer funding this? It seems to me that we should give the tax dollars, the hundreds of millions of dollars back to the taxpayer, and the people who are going to benefit from this ought to pay it. So. Help me understand why the market doesn't cover this and why the taxpayers have to have to have to help these businesses with this product. That, that would uh, maybe best directed to Washington D.C. that made these uh, funds available. They've been made available to Kentucky, and uh, the way that we're anticipating deploying these, there would be uh, little, if any, uh, state funds associated with these deployments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and we're going to get back to that in a little bit, but uh, in all fairness, uh, the funds were made available at the federal level, but they weren't pushed upon the states. That's correct. So it is a choice by the state to take those funds and then any commensurate cost associated with maintaining, repairing, replacing, or in perpetuity, or handing this off, or if something fails, and all kinds of contingencies. We'll get into those. And Mr. Chairman, real quick, I yes. want to be clear, I wasn't saying we should or we shouldn't, I just don't understand the philosophy that this is a, a, a private thing, why would the taxpayer be funded? So I'm not saying I'm either way, I just wanted to know the, the theory. And I didn't mean, to, didn't mean to imply that if it sounded like it. It's a question of when you make that choice, there are consequences to those choices and there are costs associated with those choices and that's what we're gonna try to understand better. Uh, Senator McDaniel, Co-Chairman McDaniel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to just very tangentially piggyback on um, uh, Representative Tipton here, and guys, this is just an open invitation. When we did the fees affiliated with electric vehicles last year in House Bill 8, the intent was to leave the period open for comments. And obviously, the, the more we move along, the more that will affect our road funding. So to the extent the cabinet, and, and particularly you guys who, who are in the actual operational area, have ideas about the best way to capture in, in those revenues towards a road fund, please let us know. Please submit those to us you guys cabinet wide, because obviously it will have a big impact on our infrastructure for the next generation. And we certainly want to make sure we get the funding uh, portion of it right. So I just wanted to extend the invitation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will Thank join you, that sir. invitation also. This is a major shift or can be. 
uh, to existing funding mechanisms and existing structures. Senator Meredith, you got a question or a comment? Question, Mr. Chair, if I could. And I appreciate that uh, this thing's still in its infancy and there's a lot to learn, but I'm always concerned about unintended consequences. Um, when you talk about operating and maintaining these stations, you know, in theory, in theory, what we want to do is, uh, the government wants to do is eliminate gasoline stations. So we're going to be in competition with gasoline stations. Will, will gasoline stations get first priority as the location of these uh, charging stations? We have not dug into those, uh, to the selection criteria to, to, to nail down, you know, prioritization of deployments. But we recognize that the, uh, the, the fuel system within Kentucky is, is uh, it has is of the ubiquitous nature that it um, uh, makes sense for for some of these to be deployed at uh, fueling stations. But uh, that being said, we're not uh, we're not steering these one way or another. Mm -hmm. We're making these funds available for the applicants to uh, to deploy where it makes sense for uh, the the uh, for for the applicant. Well, with all due respect, I think some thought has to be given to what impact this is going to have on. Uh, uh, service stations and in businesses associated with that and you know as this thing evolves at some point in time we may create gasoline deserts because if you don't have the margin to stay in business and we've seen it with uh, the situation with uh, replacing um, storage tanks people couldn't afford that and we had to shut down the gasoline station so is any thought given at all to this kind of transition plan that as these things start to proliferate then it is going to place a financial burden on existing filling stations, gasoline stations that won't provide this service, can't provide that service, and how do they continue to exist, and how do we assure in rural Kentucky that there's still access to um, um, gasoline? That, that's a problem for, for rural Kentucky. We're, we're coordinating very closely with, uh, with the Petroleum Manufacturers Association. In fact, uh, uh, Justin's sneaking out of here very quickly after this uh, testimony to go uh, present at the uh, Kentucky Petroleum Manufacturers Association. So we're we're very uh, tightly coordinating with with all interested parties, and uh, we're we're listening to them most attentively. Well, the most interested party is going to be the consumer, and again, it's a challenge already for uh, real communities with the price of gasoline increasing what it has to even survive, but. I could see this thing could really get out of hand in a very short period of time if we don't give some forethought to it. But thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Follow up on that real quick. Uh, when is your when will, do you anticipate RFPs being issued? We're hoping, uh, looking at the end of this year, early next year for the initial RFPs. So we may be two, three months away. Yes, sir. Okay. So has that consideration been included in the RFP guides, the guidelines for that, that there might be a preferencing to existing structure or preferencing against existing structures? We have not, uh, we're in the process of developing that and we haven't got, uh, uh, haven't got those details worked out yet. You have started the process. Yes, we've started, we've gathered a bunch of considerations as we're, um, and we just finished uh, the, the first round of coordinating with industry last week. And so this month is, uh, or the next month, month and a half, is when we'll dig deep into that development. And that's the RFI receipts? Yes, sir. Yeah, 36 responses or entities responded? Yes, sir. Can you share those to this committee? We'll do. Can yes, you do sir. that within seven days? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Representative Blanton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, quick question or two. Um, first of all, just so I'm perfectly clear, we're going to take this money, we're going to build these out, and we're going to put these, in some instances at least, on current existing business properties. Uh, and most likely it's going to need to be uh, placed where people can have time because it's not like pumping gas. You're in and out in five minutes that they can go in and out. So we go in and we install these. Who provides the power to charge these? Is that on the business owner that owns that uh, property? Or is that something that is that the state pays the, the electricity bill on? The, just to be clear, the, the state is not anticipating to own or operate any of these stations. So they would be deployed and whatever, uh, whatever uh, agreement that the, uh, the, the landowner and the operator of the uh, uh, electric charger uh, works out regarding uh, leasing of the site or, uh, or uh, energy 
payment, that would be between them and the state would not be involved. Okay, so the profit would go to the landowner uh, in this situation. Uh, are we going to pick winners and losers? What if you go down Restaurant Row where I come from and you got several C stores and restaurants through there? Um, are we going to decide which one's going to get one and which one's not? It's going to be the, the – we're looking at the selection criteria based on the uh, best available proposals that we get, so the best value proposals. So are we looking, anticipating um, maybe some investments uh, being included in this project from the property owners to get the stations on their property? It, it, it's possible. Uh, I think the, the best value is going to be the ones that, uh, that uh, would have limited investment required to bring those up to deployment. Uh, but we're open to uh, the, the best proposal at the best locations that fills out the uh, AFC network in Kentucky. Okay. One short last question, Mr. Chairman. Um, who will set the rates? If, if I go to a station in one city uh, and I charge and the next city I go to, am I going to pay a different rate? Is that going to be based on kilowatts per hour? Is that going to be – does the – does the business owner set a rate what they want to charge? How are we going to find consistency? Um, not that we have a lot of consistency in our gas prices, but um, some consistency. It goes up all at the same time at least. Um, but how is that going to look? We're coordinating closely with Public Service Commission who, will, uh, who, who regulates that. And we're um, – it, based on what we understand in our coordination, there will be slight variations based on electricity rates in different areas of the, of the state. But uh, uh, the regulation of that, we're, we're talking with them, but uh, I don't have the answer to that, sir. Okay. Thanks. And sorry, uh, if I could add, um, Federal Highways has also, in their proposed rulemaking that we're waiting on for the final rulemaking, um, has dictated some type of um, requirements to make sure that people are not, um, quote unquote, being like price gouged um, with these EV rates. And so there will be some um, sort of uh, like measures in place to make sure that people aren't just being charged like outrageous EV um, rates for charging at these charging stations. But we're just not sure to, with those final rates. Might Very be. good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Carroll, question, comment? Question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, have there been any um, comparisons made on what the savings is for like for a full charge for a vehicle compared to what a, a full tank of gas would be when you look at the cost, uh, maybe looking at the average cost of electricity. Do we know how much savings there is? Without knowing the rates, it's uh, well uh, an average rate. I mean, if we're going if we're going by that area, I wouldn't think there would be a huge amount of fluctuation across uh, the state. We've not looked at that today. Okay. How long does it take to charge with one of these rapid chargers? How long does it take for a rapid charger? If, if uh, with with all ports being used, it would roughly be about 30 minutes. Uh, we are looking at uh, uh, power sharing options where with a station that has four chargers with 600 kilowatts available, then it's potential if they're the only ones at the station, then that would be accelerated for that uh, for that user. Uh, so it would be less than 30 minutes, but 30 minutes is roughly the industry standard. Have you seen studies when, if we look at, if we went to entire electric cars, how many of these charging stations would it take in the state if we replaced every car with an electronic, with an electric car? That, to me, that seems outrageous to think that's even feasible. Well, just for clarity, the, the majority of, of uh, charging will be done at home, not at these uh, DCFC. Well, holidays when there's so much travel on the road? It would be generally pass-through traffic or tourist traffic that would uh, use DCFC, and it'd be when they're traveling long distances. And so, um, but we have not looked at the full conversion. We have looked at uh, anticipated growth of electric vehicles along our quarters and staged that out to... Uh, about 2030, 2040 to see how many chargers would be needed along each of our corridors. Well, it seems like we need to look at the end of the road before we start driving that road. Um, I mean, I, I can't, the logistics of it seem impossible to me, but um, it's, it's all moving so quickly, it's just hard to absorb it all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Douglas, question, comment? Question, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Moore, you just made a comment that 
most of the charging will be done at home, and that's assuming that, that consumers are able to afford the hookup. We have a lot of apartment buildings and a lot of large buildings where there are a lot of people who park. That may not be possible, but, that, but my question here is this. I'm concerned about the security of the people of the Commonwealth, and they're going to have to pull up to these stations, and we're assuming it's going to be 30 minutes, but if there are four charging stations and you've got eight or nine or 10 vehicles, that's not 30 minutes. That's a little bit more than 30 minutes by my math. Um, my question is, who pays for security at these areas and who pays for accommodations? Because those facilities are going to cost money. So it's not just going to be the cost of the electricity that some of our consumers are going to be exposed to. It's going to be the upgrades to these buildings. Could you, could you talk about that a little bit and, and, and let me know if that is something that's being considered um, in the proposals that you're making? The uh, available accommodations at the, uh, at the locations is, is a factor that we're looking at that goes into the suitability, you know, to have, uh, to have the, the, the uh, physical security of that area, uh, whether there's lighting and, and uh, perhaps uh, canopy, something to do during those 30 minutes that you may be sitting there charging. Those are factors that, uh, that will be considered. Uh, don't have specifics yet on, on, uh, on those nuances. Uh, but uh, that, uh, we don't anticipate there's a, that, uh, that those will be supported, those uh, accommodations will be supported by this funding. It would be something that would generally naturally grow up on its own around these chargers. Or maybe there already that uh, that um, a a proposer would take advantage of. Just Sir, one follow up. I, I really would prefer that we stop using the thirty minute. It's gonna. It may take thirty minutes to charge, but um, like like most of the people in the general assembly and most of the people here in the Commonwealth, it's 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 pretty unusual when you pull into a high traffic area and you're able to pull right up to the pumps, even as, as the pumps are now. And I don't anticipate that being any different with the EVs. So my concern is that we're throwing out this 30 minute uh, time limit and we're, essentially, we're essentially suggesting this to the people of the Commonwealth when we know that likely that's gonna be a rarity. Um, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Webb, question or comment? Um. Well, question, uh, after a brief comment, you know, I I'm going to go kick it and scream it into this new road because uh, I like my diesel, I like my horse trailer, I travel way too many miles and don't have much time to do what I do now. But uh, separate and apart from that, um, when, and I've sat through a couple presentations to municipalities on, on the potential of these stations being placed, so I understand a little bit about the, what, what's, what's maybe coming. But um, what about required maintenance? I mean, I can't help but analogize them to the air machine when your tire's going flat and you can't find one that works between here and, and Moorhead on the way home. Uh, it, is there a requirement to maintain or a time frame of maintenance or requirements being looked at in the rulemaking process or be anywhere else to require? I mean, I represent rural Kentucky. Uh, if we've got one station and it's out of order, I mean, that's going to put a lot of people at a standstill and, and uh, cause what Senator Douglas was talking about there. And, you know, I'm in an area plagued with ice storm, and if you look, call it what you will, but we're having more ice storms in East Kentucky. They're devastating. I've had counties, people go without power for 40 days. Uh, so those are concerns that I have in the practical reality of this and how, uh, you know, notwithstanding the insufficient grid capacity that we have now. So there's a, there's a lot to be said here. I know you all appreciate the work you're doing, but uh, we certainly want to be kept informed uh, of things on every level, but we appreciate you being here today. Thank you. And if I may, the operations and maintenance, is, that's a factor within the, uh, the EV industry today, and it's one that, uh, that uh, the industry is, is working to self-police themselves. For example, uh, Ford, when they... Uh, they won't list a charge a charger that uh, does not have appropriate uh, uh, maintenance uh, or uptime is the uh, is, is the, the industry term and so we're looking to incorporate some of those requirements into our RFP uh, uh, part of that is a is part of the national conversation and uh, I don't know what the feds are going to require but uh, we know that that's a significant consideration with these charters that we 
want to make sure is, is included. Yeah, and I'll just add that um, Federal Highways right now is looking at the uptime being about 97%. Um, now, we have asked exactly what that uptime means, um, you know, when we have like a storm or an ice storm or something, and uh, that's what we're waiting for in their final ruling. Thank you. Representative Bridges, a comment or a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I about decided not to ask this, but just this really quick. On your 50-mile distance, mm -hmm. uh, with the highways we have now, do we meet those requirements? on the interstates, the parkways and all that, are there exits every 50 miles or so? Yes, okay. uh, they, that, it's much harder in uh, the western states, but Kentucky, we can cover that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The RFPs that you are, they're under consideration, they anticipate uh, one entity per location or one entity per multiple locations or one entity for all locations? We're, uh, that, that's part of the considerations that we have. Uh, we anticipate at least one entity per location, uh, but we're open to one entity per multiple locations. I don't foresee one statewide entity, uh, but we're not uh, averse to that. Is there any problem with the federal money requirements on the federal money for this program if a bid is not successful and RFP fails at a location? so that you're no longer within the 50 mile requirement. Does that defeat the money or have any adverse fiscal impact? It does not uh, negate the funding. It does limit our ability to move off of, move the funding off of the alternative fuels corridor. But that being said, if you have uh, one, say that's right at the 50 mile limit that is unsuccessful, you could come back with two at, at uh, 25 miles and uh, fully build out the corridor. So move to an interchange either side of that location and deploy there and meet the criteria. And, and then just for general benefits, so you complete the first phase with the main corridors, and if that's successful, the next intent would be to go to uh, lesser traveled roads? To move off of the, uh, to move uh, uh, fast charters out of, off of the alternative fuels corridor, uh, develop the, uh, the orange corridors that we saw, as well as potentially to move into community chargers um, which is the longer duration chargers, with more for uh, office or, or home-based charging. And do you anticipate at this time phase one, two, or three that you just mentioned would all be included within the 69.5 million of federal funds, or would that take additional state funds to do what you just mentioned? As of right now, we anticipate uh, phases one and two for certain uh, within the limit of the volatility uh, being funded within the, uh, the, the available Navy funds. The beyond that, um, uh, we, we will go until we until the funding runs out. When a uh, see if this is correct, RFP would we refer to this as a lease or a contract lease or a contract? What would you refer to that as once it's a successful bid? Uh, looking at uh, different mechanisms, uh, looking at potentially a a reimbursement grant or. Um, uh, something along those lines that uh, uh, show, show activity and get reimbursed. Uh, not necessarily that the specifics are, are still under consideration. We've had a, a broad variety of mechanisms that we've looked at, but uh, we've narrowed it down, but don't have one specific yet. So possibly a performance matrix for reimbursement? Potentially, yes, sir. With a renewal period or a rebidding of the location? We anticipate after the uh, uh, after the five years of the Navy program that uh, my, my goal would be to back out of the marketplace and not be involved. Um, don't necessarily anticipate this being, uh, there no indications that I'm aware of that this would be extended, um, but uh, beyond the, the performance period that we have, we anticipate these would be fully private without uh, state involvement. So are you anticipating those would be five-year contracts? Uh, that's potentially that's part of the O and M aspects that we're uh, having to work through to make sure because we wanted them to to have at least a five year lifespan, but uh, want them to be successful beyond that as well. And when the at this point, when the Fed money, federal money ceases, uh, you would anticipate no cost to the Commonwealth. Uh, it, for the AFC quarter, the way we've uh, laid it out is. Uh, would be fully locally matched or privately matched to uh, to deploy these. Uh, when we get off into the community chargers, um, we have not looked down at that 
uh, to date. So you do anticipate that they would be self-performing? Yes. Okay. And basically turn into a private industry at that point? Correct. So that would be a subsidized private industry, subsidized startup? Subsidized startup, yes, sir. And if I understand the RFP correct, you're asking the participants, the applicants, to come up with a particular match, 20%? Uh, 20% is written into the legislation, yes, sir. Okay. And I believe in House Bill 1, we had a little over $17.3 million set aside an operating budget for KYTC to hit the match of 20%. So that match is no longer needed if the RFP is successful. If we, Yes, that, that is correct. We're not... Uh, our current plans are not to utilize those funds for matching these uh, these deployments. All right, so that could be lapsed first day of January then, uh, without affecting this program. There there are some some locations where if they are uh, if they are less successful uh, in getting bids that uh, uh, it may require um, additional subsidization to get them get them going. In those cases, that the that there may be a requirement to. If we want those to, to be fully built out, then uh, the, the, there, there's a possibility that we would need to utilize that, but that's not our first goal. We're, we're it's a possibility, not first preference. Yes, absolutely. Uh, understood. And so if we do not have successful RFP uh, applicants for 1, 2, 12 locations, then the consideration is the state may put its own money in, in addition to federal money in order to get those operational. That is a possibility, yes, sir. Again, we would have a fully subsidized location against private industry at that point. I would not anticipate that uh, that we would ever consider a situation that is fully state subsidized. Uh, it's, import it's important to have local skin in the game so there's ownership of it and uh, so that their investment is successful. That's the reason we went with, uh, we're starting at fully uh, private uh, leveraged. Have you thought about is it under consideration for the RFP design that there be bonding requirements in the event one of these companies begins and then fails or seems to be um, starting and then fails, walks away, finds a better market, goes away for whatever reason so that we're not left? That's something that's under consideration, yes, sir. Active consideration rather than is it perfunctory? Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> Are there any any requirements or conditions that we might that you see may be violated that would put the federal money at risk, either a clawback or a cessation or something? I, there's not any requirements that I've seen in the NEVI program that uh, facilitates a, a clawback from the feds. Justin, are you? No. Different question altogether. In the petroleum industry, we have Department of Ag that oversees measurements, certifies. So that especially if there's a fee charged and then taxes thereafter, it's at least accurate. Um, is your plan include the Department of Ag to oversee that measurement also? We've started conversations with that. We've not fully uh, investigated that. So that's not in the plan that's submitted to the feds? That's correct. Okay. And we don't have a resolution of that. Who else would do it except for Department of Ag? Uh, that would be the, the primary uh, consideration. All right. And we're going to have to have oversight of measurement, yes. correct? That's correct. Okay. So what's the anticipated cost of performing that oversight function? I, I do not have that number. Do we have an estimated number? I, I do not, sir. Do we have any number at all in the cabinet that estimates that? Uh, no, sir. Was it not estimated because it was considered de minimis or just did not consider it? Uh, we have not developed that aspect of it uh, at this time. You mentioned PSC involvement earlier. Um, I'm not sure I followed where you were going on that. So is PSC going to be overseeing the Commonwealth in its entirety relative to a range or the actual price of what's charged at the pumps at R4 fee? Um, so with working with um, PSC, uh, they will be putting um, in the next year, um, they will start looking at sort of guidelines for the utilities that they regulate. Um, and then, of course, it's just guidelines for those utilities to follow. Um. Understood. You mentioned enforcement for price gouging or at least, uh, at least orders regarding it to make sure it doesn't occur, whatever it might be defined as. Who would be the enforcement agency for that? 
Uh, I would presume the attorney general's, but I do not know. And what's the estimated cost additional to the AG's office for performing that function? Uh, I do not have that, sir. Do we have an estimate at all? No, sir. There's a Justice 40 requirement that's mentioned in your presentation and then the federal documents as well as your plan. Um, would the Justice 40 include some kind of preferential treatment for persons who are already offering petroleum services at those exchanges to make sure it's equitable? To my understanding of the Justice 40 requirements is that 40% of the benefit goes to uh, the Justice 40 designated communities. Uh, it's not my understanding that uh, that uh, any petroleum manufacturer uh, or, or current stations would be uh, benefited by that at all. And that's a federal requirement without discretion at the state level, is that correct? It's a uh, point of emphasis. I don't know if it is a requirement. So may not be a requirement, point of emphasis, so yes. that's a decision by the executive administration to put that in state administration to put that requirement in that that factor is a um, as of right now currently the the considerations for justice 40 is, is somewhat nebulous and uh, we're waiting further guidance with a final rule on how that's to be considered so I don't have a lot of information on how that's being considered but as we sit here today it's not a requirement of this program uh, it's correct from a federal requirement of this program, point of emphasis only. I believe so. Uh, with Justice 40, um, it, Justice 40 uh, has to be looked at, yes. <laughs> Slide number five, I'm not sure how you had those numbers, but we're talking about uh, RFI information received and you're gonna reach back out to quote unquote select firms We've actually reached out to all the firms that, that submitted. Very good. Um, and I know I wasn't able to, but um, in development of the plan, I noticed when I read through it that, um, that a lot of stakeholders uh, were uh, consulted, and, and that's a very good practice. Uh, whom out of the General Assembly leadership was involved as a, as a working partner? I am not aware of any. OK. Senator West. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, quick question on um, once implemented. So uh, once all the charging stations are in place uh, and the EVs start using the stations, uh, is there going to be enough power to supply the stations? And have you met with power the power companies to ask them this question? Do they, are we going to possibly experience brownouts or is the current capability to provide enough power we've coordinated extensively with uh, with with the utility companies and uh, we, we've been assured from the power companies that uh, with the anticipated uh, um, transition that that power availability would not be an issue until we get to uh, more of the higher uh, higher level chargers the 350 kilowatt uh, chargers or um, and the the anticipated conversion is slow enough that the municipalities and the, the, the utilities indicate that they have capacity to um, to adjust as they go. There may be some some uh, location specific items where a fleet comes online of, uh, of uh, electric uh, vehicles that will put uh, a unique load on the uh, on the system. But uh, through our coordination, they're not concerned with this today. We Senator Meredith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick follow-up question. On slide four, your charging station cost, you got a wide spread there from 800000 $1.2 million. It says based on power availability, site design, layout, and so forth. How, how much is the cost of the, of, the, of the charging station itself? Because I'm assuming that in this cost you're talking about building the infrastructure to support the charging station, plus the cost of the charging, charging station. How much is the cost of the charging station itself? Uh, so the station itself is going to be about the 800000 uh, And then if the site has to be, uh, that substation has to be upgraded, that's where you kind of get into the one, up to the uh, $1.2 million. Um, so uh, with the locations that we've talked with the utilities, if we can, um, install these stations or get them implemented where the substation does not need to be updated 
um, then we are looking more at that lower number. What's the estimated useful life for a charging station? Um, right now, it's between five and seven years. All right. Thank you. Representative Bakul, if you have a quick question or comment, otherwise we're going to be moving on. You got one? Uh, just a quick one. Is that okay? Yes. Uh, just very simply, with the RFP for the charge stations, are, are, is that uh, small business friendly or is it just going to be corporations have the more of the heads up on this? Uh, the, those nuances are still being developed, but we're open to all comers um, that, uh, that we don't have emphasis on one end or the other. If we were to do all as one proposal, then it would be more lean to the corporation, but uh, we anticipate a mixture, if not uh, um, uh, individual stations at least. So there's, um, don't anticipate it to be uh, leaning one way or another, but open. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moore, Mr. Herod. Thank you all very much. I thank think you. you understand that there's an open invitation to work with you from uh, Chairman McDaniel as well as myself, and I look forward to doing so. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Next up on the agenda, we have federal funds appropriated for tourism recovery and investment. I believe we had listed uh, Secretary Mike Berry, Tourism Arts and Heritage Cabinet, Mike Manjot, Commissioner, same cabinet. If you, the two of you will introduce yourselves for the record, please. Hi, I'm Mike Berry. I'm the Secretary of Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet. And I'm Mike Manjit, Commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Travel. If you'll raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. If, if, um, if you will, just give us a brief overview. I know we've got presentation materials that have been handed out. If we can have a brief overview, and I think we can keep this relatively short. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank the members of the General Assembly for the bipartisan investment in travel and tourism. We all know that the pandemic impacted the tourism sector a great deal, and on behalf of the uh, tourism cabinet and also, more importantly, our uh, industry partners out throughout the Commonwealth, we appreciate the historic investment. Uh, and not only recovery, but it is our belief that we will come out of this stronger uh, as a result. Uh, because the program is administered through the Department of Travel Development, uh, I would uh, turn it over to the commissioner who will walk through the policies and procedures. Uh, thank you, Secretary Barry, and thank you, Chairman Petrie and Chairman McDaniel for the invitation to be here today. Uh, as the Secretary stated, the legislation authorizing this funding for our industry tasked us with developing and administering these federally funded programs which is a first for our department. Prior to, the, prior to the pandemic, the Department of Tourism had never worked with or distributed federal funds. Because of this, we have been a diligent and very intentional in developing these programs to ensure that funds will be used appropriately under federal ARPA guidelines and, most importantly, to follow the intent of the legislation. As a quick reminder, um, as a quick reminder, $75 million was, was divided into four pools or tranches of money. Tranche one, $15 million for marketing and promoting tourism in Kentucky. These funds will be used primarily by the Department of Tourism to supplement our existing marketing efforts and to help us develop new geographic and demographic target markets. Our planning for these funds is underway. It was delayed a little bit with an agency review for a uh, marketing and advertising firm. Uh, they are a very important strategic partner. That review is now complete, and we are full speed ahead in planning for those, that $15 million. Pool number two, $25 million distributed to tourism commissions for marketing communities. This tranche requires a 10% match from the local tourism commissions and uses and uses of the funds shall be similar to the tourism marketing incentive program, which our agency currently administers. Pool number three, $25 million distributed to tourism commissions for attracting meetings and conventions. And pool number four, $10 million to tourism commissions for multi-jurisdiction collaborative destination marketing. This pool also requires a 10% match from the local tourism commissions and uses shall be similar, again, to the TMIP program. This tranche requires a tourism commission as a primary grantee and a minimum of four additional tourism commission partners. Priority on these grants will be given to projects that have the potential for long-term transformational impacts in their region. Uh, the balance of my presentation will really focus on, on these pools um, two through four. Before we move too far ahead, a couple of things I want to point out, uh, a few items. The legislation was very specific 
in that for tranches two, three, and four, the funds are to be distributed to tourism commissions. For tranches two and four, the legislation, as I've already said, stated that the uses of the funds shall be similar to the tourism marketing incentive program our office administers. However, the bill did not provide a definition of tourism commission, which became our first priority. Working with legal teams from the Tourism Arts and Heritage Cabinet and the Finance Cabinet, we created the definition you see for, uh, formed, I'm sorry, you see on the screen, allowing commissions that are formed under KRS 91A or defined as a designated marketing organization or tourism region under our administrative regulations pertaining to the existing TMIP program. This is important because not all counties have tourism commissions. We have a few local chambers of commerce and fiscal courts, for, exa for example, that have participated in our TMIP program for many years that are not tourism commissions and would not have been eligible for these funds. This defini definition allows them to participate. We also created an emergency administrative regulation outlining the program and providing the cited authority needed for KDT to, to disperse these funds. While this was going on, we also began working on creating the guidelines and applications for each of these tranches. This process took many weeks, as you can imagine, and we made sure the programs met ARPA and statutory requirements. Applicants had to show the impact of COVID to their communities and the local tourism economy on each of the applications. And keep in mind, if eligible, the tourism commissions could apply for a grant from each of these tranches. We also researched other states around the country to see how they had utilized ARPA funds and to seek advice, advice and counsel on the application process. And I will tell you that was invaluable to us. I reached out to my counterpart in Arizona, for instance. They had received about $100 million uh, a year prior. So that she was able to help us, even came into our industry conference to talk to the industry about pitfalls, what the you know, the obstacles to try and avoid. So it was very helpful uh, from, that, from that standpoint. Uh, our staff also created online application forms, specific web pages for each pool, a continuously updated FAQ matrix for each of the programs and had uh, and continue to have ongoing conversations and meetings with our tourism industry partners. As you can see from this timeline, we began work as soon as possible. Once the bill was final, we met as quickly as possible to put together a plan of action and work schedule. We filed the first emergency regulation on July 1 and then held a training webinar for our industry partners on July 25th, providing an overview of each tranche, discussing who was eligible to apply, the types of expenses that were eligible, ARPA reporting guidelines, application deadlines, et cetera. Um, you see the final line there, due to the devastating floods in Eastern Kentucky, we decided to extend all the application dates by 30 days and an updated emergency regulation was filed to show those new deadlines. Now, as you can imagine, having done a lot of um, committee hearings like this via Zoom, uh, sometimes people tend to not ask questions on Zoom. So we realized that. And literally the day after our online training program, we went out on what we called our ARPA Roadshow. Um, we did in-person meetings that same week with tourism industry partners around the state, review each tranche in more depth and answer any questions they may ha might have on each program. And believe me, they had a whole lot of questions. Uh, tourism people are nothing if not creative. And if we get one more call and says, what do you think about this or how about this? Uh, I've just said at this point, send in your applications, folks. Uh, but in all honesty, the meetings were very beneficial for our partners, but also for us, uh, the staff, as we were putting this together, allowed us to answer their questions in person and just as importantly, listen to their ideas and concerns. Uh, what are some of those concerns you may ask? Well, it, part of the concern was, how much time they would need to plan and decide how they would utilize the funding. Keep in mind, this came at a time when most of their budgets for the fiscal year had been set or already approved. Uh, they needed to find out where they could get the 10% match that they had already obligated to something else. And many times they had to go back to their tourism commissions and ask for special board meetings to amend their budget. At the local level, sometimes that means you also have to go to your fiscal court uh, or your city commission or both if you're, if you're a city county commission. So it took some time. But more importantly, they really wanted to put thought and effort into uh, how they were going to use this money effectively. Uh, this slide is kind of an overcap or, or a, a recap, excuse me, of all three pools and where we stand today. Uh, as you can see on the slide, applications for tranche two, the $25 million for DMOs, closed on September 30. We received 94 applications for these funds. 
tranche three uh, applications, 25 million for meetings and conventions closed on October 10th, and we, re we received 19 applications for those funds. Our staff is currently reviewing the applications to ensure they are in compliance with our TMIP, ARPA guidelines, the KRS, and working on contracts for each of these applicants. Again, part of this process is that each applicant will have to sign a contract with our cabinet to receive the, fundings, the funding. The application deadline for tranche four, the multi-jurisdiction marketing uh, is actually this Friday, November 4th. Uh, currently, we have five applications um, as of this morning. Uh, I can assure you I know of one uh, tourism commission who is actually participating in five separate applications. <laughs> At least they've indicated they are. We've received none of those. So the next few days are going to be very busy in our office receiving the applications, and then we'll start that review process. Uh, that's a very quick overview of, of where we stand on the program, how we're, we're working with the funding, but I'm very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Senator, Senator Meredith. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's very interesting to see how this is going to work. Just wonder if there's going to be any provision for waiving or reducing the 10% match. And the reason I ask that question, in light of what's happened in Western Kentucky this past December and Eastern Kentucky with the flooding, 10% might not be there, but it shouldn't exclude those folks from some consideration. So is there any provision for, for uh, that? We did not have the uh, flexibility to offer that because the 10% match was lit, written into the legislation. So we have to follow how the, how the legislation is written. Uh, I can tell you from uh, my review of, and, and don't hold this as 100% gospel, um, but I would say that that has not impacted the application process uh, on, on the 25 million. I can't speak to the, to the tranche four because it's not closed yet, but on tranche two, the 25 million directly to DMOs, we did not see any problem with that. Um, I think there was one who could, it wasn't a financial issue. They could not get their board to meet to adjust their budget, if that makes sense. But we've not seen a 10% uh, be an be a, a obstacle to anyone applying. I don't doubt your word, but uh, would it be an obstacle to people submitting an application to begin with? They're going to say, we don't have the 10%, so why even submit an application? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I can't speak to that, sir. I, no one's reached out to us and, and said that was an issue for them. I will tell you of the 94, it was about the number we expected because that's about the number of organizations as defined that regularly participate in our TMIP program, if that makes sense to you. Uh, and keep in mind the ARPA applications, the ARPA funding, excuse me, are only eligible um, for, for tourism recovery if you were in existence prior to March of, of 2020. So any new um, organizations that may have been established in the last couple of months or something, and there I don't, can't think of any off the top of my head, would not have been eligible anyway. So um, if that's the case, that has not been brought to our attention of someone not applying due to the, not being able to do the 10%. Match. I appreciate that being interesting to monitor it over the next uh, year to see where we are, but certainly the intent of these funds are always to get the, the monies to those in most need. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when we structure these things, we do just opposite of what we intend to do. So we need to watch it closely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, with the applications received in pool two and three, mm -hmm. before we get to close out, uh, do the application amounts exceed the amount in each of the pools? No, sir. Um, pool two, tranche two for the DMOs, currently, um, I don't have the exact figure, but I can get it to you. It's about a million dollars of the 25 that has not been applied for. Um, for tranche three, the 25 for meetings, conventions, we're still reviewing some of those. We've got a couple of questions on whether they uh, apply or not. It will be significantly less than that. I, I'm going to estimate, again, I'll, I can get this number for you if you want, uh, a couple of hundred thousand dollars that's left. Our plans, and this may go back to Senator Meredith's question as well, uh, our plan right now is to um, potentially do a second round of the funding uh, sometime in the spring uh, and give first priority to anyone who did not either apply on the front end or everyone in tranche two received, because that was a formula that, that we had to use, um, but not that it go to the same folks, if that makes sense. No, I understand. Mm -hmm. so separately, we've got pools two, three, and four in the slides are treated separately from pool one. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got the initial listing of one, two, three, four in the quadrants. And then later on, we talk about 
uh, pool two, 25 million applications open to open, closed considerations. Mm -hmm. Don't have the same designation on pool one, and I know pool one is more for marketing, but yes, what, what, what kind of guidelines or are there anything familiar? Is it just an open application forever? How's, what's the setup on pool one? Pool one was not an application process. Pool one came to the state to market. So what we're doing with that right now, as I, as I referenced earlier, is um, we're using a template that we use as some CARES funding that we received last year, where we really, we had our, our base funding program and marketing campaign set for the year. And then we went in and looked at, okay, what other markets can we look at, whether that's new geographic markets, uh, new demographic markets, Hispanic travel, black travel, LGBTQ travel, uh, et cetera, did research on those and then, and then use that money specifically in those markets. We had a great return on that, by the way. Uh, we had a 66 to one return on our advertising awareness last year, which is, it sounds like I'm patting myself on the back. I'm patting my staff on the back. That's unheard of. Usually if you get a 10 or 12 or 15 to one, that's a great year. We had 66 to one specifically on our campaigns last year. And in those new markets, it was actually 101 to one. Um, and what that means is for every dollar we spent, we saw $101 in revenue come back to the state. Um, that's fantastic. That's the model we're going to use with this money as well. We're, we're not just going to dump all of it on top of what we're doing, um, but um, you'll see most of that money hit beginning in the spring, which is our busy time. And right now we're in the process of planning for that. So that $15 million pool was not part of the grant process. Mm -hmm. What I'm and correct, and what I'm interested in is there a written policy guideline or matrix for decisions on how the money goes out? Described in principle, mm -hmm. uh, but is there a written policy that that's? No, we're 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 following basically um, our, our regular guidelines as I was trying to outline there on, on okay. how we're marketing to the state. You know, that part of that money may go to families, 25 to 54 to attract families. Part of that may, money may go to millennials coming in for a bourbon weekend. Part of that money may go international from a, from a standpoint of trying to draw in more international visitors. And the General Assembly or this committee in particular, has it received any kind of list of who has applied and who's been approved in Pool 2, Pool no, 3, sir. or about to be in Pool 4? No, sir. As I said, Pool 4 is still open. We're happy to supply that. We, we, we're still processing, make sure everybody is, yep. we have everything in place. No, you've got a lot yep. to do. How quickly can you get the two and three over to us of who applied and who was approved? Um, we can get that probably within 10 days. So let's say 14 days, do that okay. in two weeks. And then uh, on four, when it closes out, just get it as quickly as possible. Sure. Four, four is the one that's going to be the most interesting for us. Um, it's, as I said, our tourism friends are very creative. Yeah. Uh, and especially with the legislation saying priority giving to those that are transformational, that's a little bit of a guessing game. Understood. Um, but uh, we'll certainly get that information to you. Very good. See no other questions, comments? Thank you both very much, Secretary Thank Commissioner. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda, we have disposition of bond authorization for parks. I have Russ Myers, Parks Commissioner, Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet, and I have Jennifer Linton, uh, Finance and Administration Cabinet. It looks like we may have a secretary that's going to stick around also. Why not? Um, if it's if okay it, with you, sir. It, it is. Thank you very much. If the three of you will identify yourselves for the records, make sure your bright green lights are on and your microphones are close enough to you. Mike Berry, Secretary of the Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet. Russ Meyer, Commissioner of Parks. Uh, my name is Jennifer Linton. I'm the Executive Director of the, at the Office of Facility Development and Efficiency and Finance. Very good. Wait of you raise your right <clears throat> hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. I do. Thank you very much. If you will, uh, you will give us a brief overview. I don't know that I have a presentation on this. Do I? We do. Okay, it was a late arrival. How many screens are we going to be looking at? Because we're on limited times. We understood that we had 10 minutes with presentation questions and there's, things. There's about eight slides of information. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's, can uh, let's keep it quick, just as an overview, and then we'll have a few questions, and we'll see how it opens up. All, All right. right, thank you. You want me to go? Go ahead. Um, Chair Petrie, Chair McDaniel, uh, members of the A&R, Senator, and, uh, and Representative members, thank you all for having us here today. Um, last time we approached uh, you all with an invite was, uh, I think, back in July of this year. So uh, there haven't been a lot of changes with this uh, 
50 million, but there, there are a few, and we were, we're um, pleased and happy to give you a report. As you know, the General Assembly uh, authorized $50 million to improve our parks for the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and we want to uh, personally thank you all for reinvesting in our parks. Um, in two, 2019, House Bill 268, 50 million bond funds, which was allocated as 20.1 million for wastewater treatment and infrastructure upgrades, 11.6 million for roof repairs and replacements, 10.8 million for utilities and communication cabling infrastructure, 4.1 million for life safe system upgrades and ADA improvements, 3.4 million for hospitality upgrades. <clears throat> this grid will uh, tell you what was authorized, um, what has been transferred to projects, and what is remaining to be uh, uh, spent. And, and we'll tell you in uh, um, upcoming slides how we're planning on spending those and where that, that money is. And I think that's your uh, main objective here today. With lodge roof and repairs, um, 11.8 um, authorized. Are you on that slide? 11.6 authorized. Um, approximately 9.6 uh, transferred to projects and approximately 1.9 uh, remaining. With utilities and communications cabling, infrastructure replacement pool, 10.8 authorized. Approximately 7.6 transferred to projects, remaining 3.1. Life safety system upgrades and ADA improvement pool, 4.1 authorized, 3.7 uh, transferred to projects, and uh, 318,000 uh, remaining. Hospitality pool, 3.4 authorized, transferred to projects, 2.8 million, and remaining basically 500,000. And, and as you can see in that pool of uh, projects, we've uh, spent 80% of the money, which is, which is virtually pretty good in that amount of time. Um, wastewater treatment and infrastructure upgrades pool bond funds, 20.1, 2.2, 2.3 transferred to projects. We have 17.8 remaining. Next slide. Plans for utilizing the remaining funds. Um, one back, yeah. Lodge roof replacement and repairs pool. Currently 28 projects are underway or completed. There are five remaining projects going out for bid over the next few months that will deplete the roof pool. Other roof projects will be required with parks maintenance pool accounts. Next slide, in this slide, there's, uh, this will explain the complexity of the projects our, and our ability to spend the money. The process of uh, the procurement takes time and with complex infrastructure projects, the pro process becomes more complicated. Intergovernmental relationships have been established and uh, I feel like our team has done a great job of establishing those rela relationships across our state, in your communities, with your local governments, with federal government, and with intergovernmental agencies to maximize our dollars and efficiently use um, all the monies related to this. Forest wastewater treatment and infrastructure upgrades pool. As reported in July of 22, this is one of three pieces of legislation over three years authorizing a total of 30.1 million bond funds for wastewater treatment projects. Projects under design amount to 38.6 million. That will obligate all of the appropriated funds. We're working on a memorandum of agreement on five projects. Delays have been experienced due to working with local utility companies, local governments, private property owners, as well as trying to control costs within the current market. Upcoming projects with counties and cities include Natural Bridge, Wastewater via Powell Valley, Cumberland Falls, McCreary County, Kingdom Come, City of Cumberland, Kentucky Dam Village, Calvert City, and Lake Barkley, Cadiz. 
working on projects that will go through the design, bid, build process. Kentucky Dam Village, Phase 1 Wastewater, Natural Bridge, Phase 1 Wastewater, Dale Hollow Wastewater, Carter Caves Water, and Lake Barkley Water and Phase 1 Wastewater. And our current delays are included in, in, in waiting on approval from U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Utilities and Communications Cabling. Currently 40 projects are underway and completed. The first uh, bullet, 825,000. This is a great example of we are leveraging this money for a federal grant. 825,000 grid resilience federal infrastructure grant in the spring matched at 15% for Western Kentucky Parks, Kentucky Dam Village, Penny Rowell Forest, Ken Lake, and Lake Barkley. Estimated 995,000 to provide new water lines from Madison County to Fort Boonesboro Park entrance. Estimated $800,000 to upgrade electric at Taylorsville Lake Campground. Estimated 900,000 for Jenny Wiley Marina electrical upgrades and natural gas mainline repair. Life safety system and ADA improvement pool. Currently 11 projects are underway or completed. Remaining funds will go to a new pedway at Dale Hollow. ADA accommodations for primitive cabin rentals and restrooms at Kingdom Come State Park. And this is a great example of our, our uh, relationships with local governments where we've developed those and being able to utilize um, funds and, and uh, work efficiently that way. Parks will use additional funds from the maintenance pool for construction. Presently, partnerships include a $100,000 Fraser grant, $200,000 LWCF grant, and $100,000 from Harlan County, County Fiscal Court. Hospitality pool. Currently, 15 projects are underway or completed. Remaining funds will be used immediately to purchase furniture and other soft goods to further improve cottages that have been renovated by Kentucky Parks Construction Branch. Parks impacted would be Buckhorn, John James Audubon, Barron River, and Kentucky Dam Village. With that said, we'll entertain any, any questions, Mr. Chair. Representative Tipton, question, comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Meyer, good to see you he here again. We came yes, in sir. together back in yes, 2015. We all understand inflation, increasing construction costs, labor costs. How has that impacted the projects you've been able to complete? And has, has that caused some projects to be put on hold because there just wasn't enough money to go around after these increased costs have come into play? And could you uh, maybe at some point get us a list of what's next on the list that needs to be funded? Yes, um, it has impacted and it has delayed us in, fi in the fact that uh, we've gone to rebid certain projects. And Jennifer Linton could uh, um, explain, you know, those certain projects. Um, I think there's one actually bidding today, um, one of the wastewater projects we had bid previously, only received one bid. Sorry. Uh, one of the wastewater projects had gone out to bid a couple of months ago and came in um, about 50% over the estimate and only received one bid on it. So we have re-advertised that with bids coming in today with hopefully more competition and hopefully with better bids coming in. And um, with some of the roofs, we've just kind of had to, to be slower of putting them out to bid to make sure we're going to have enough money, see what the bids come in at to make sure to see what the next project is we're going to be able to do. Definitely has been a challenge. Great question. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tipton. Um, so understand this is not a finger pointing. This is an issue, okay? Mm -hmm. So take it that mm -hmm. way, please. Mm -hmm. We've got a $50 million tranche of money to improve parks. That was issued in the 2019 regular session, mm -hmm. pre-COVID. There's changes in administrations, there's COVID, there's all kinds of things that happen. Understand that. We had $50 million and we're a little over half at this point and I understand it's in progress. That's a long time period. Mm -hmm. Now there can be 
all kinds of reasons, but that's a long time period. In this particular instance, as we're in inflationary increase circumstances, projects that could have been bid a year ago, year and a half ago, two years ago, would not be overages. They would have been on the mark or under the mark. And the longer we go in this inflationary environment, the more those projects are going to cost. There's concern on my part, and I think some others that I've spoken with, of there is $150 million. This was a $50 million tranche. There is a $100, $150 million tranche placed in the 2022 budget session with a report coming due soon. Mm -hmm. Look forward to it. Yes. Love the parks. Want to make them better. Want to make them a marquee so other people want to come to them from all around the world. That's a good goal. Mm -hmm. But the more I look into and others look into this $50 million and the inflationary environment we're in, I'm not so sure about this $150 million that's that's set to go. And the ability to execute that timely, appropriately, and cost-savingly. Does that make sense? It's a great question and makes sense. Great statement but I, I do have, have your answer for you. I'll be glad to hear it. All right. Um, the, the monies that you're talking about is, is wastewater, utility, infrastructure monies. The complexity of these projects is the reason why that $20,000 has, there's 17, not 20,000, there's 17 million yet to be spent or shown to be spent right here in this, uh, this slide. The procurement process that we all go by, that protects the Commonwealth of Kentucky, the General Assembly, local governments, um, the, the complexity of that creates those problems of taking that long to, to complete these projects. Um, I always said that it's a it's a process, not a problem, but in a lot of ways, the process is the problem in getting it done in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. um, great example uh, was put before us because we have discussed that and we, we know that coming into our presentation on the 150 million. Ground level infrastructure projects are going to take a lot longer than above ground projects, if you will. It's just the procurement process is that way. The design, procuring, working with local governments, working with the utilities, um, local utilities, um, working with the private property owners. It just takes a while. Well, uh, I mean, a great example is, is a uh, um, road, building a new road. Uh, Senator Douglas, 68 in Jessamine County. From the inception of, of when that project got started, it took 25 years to open that road for those reasons alone. It just, big infrastructure projects take a little bit longer than the touchy-feely things that we can see, especially when they're going in the ground or you're dealing with an electric utility or a wastewater utility. So. And, um, and it's and just these things are complex it, and there exactly. are a lot of pieces and parts to it but the, but the concern remains mm -hmm. this that was 50 million we're about to attempt to deal with mm -hmm. 150 million at least that's exactly. the plan at this point exactly. so if we stay on a similar schedule we're a decade or more out before we get this done not on if we do 50 since 19 right and we've got 150 to dispose of in an appropriate manner we may be a decade out okay, there are a lot of lost opportunity costs to the rest of the Commonwealth not able to utilize that money while it's sitting here. I can, and maybe that we need to take this piece bill yeah. rather than uh, one big uh, overall package and plan is, is, mm -hmm. is what I'm rethinking. Okay. I can assure you we'll be ready. And I, I can assure you in our plan that we present to you, we will be ready. Very good. Anything else from anyone? So no questions, comments. Thank each of you for coming today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Look forward to the report. Is that December 1? It's whenever November we 1? work it out. It's before December 1 is what House Bill 1 said. Yeah.
That's good. So very good. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have up next Kentucky Employer Ease Health Plan AON projections for plan year 2024. Uh, Linda Casebeard, Deputy Secretary, Kentucky Personnel Cabinet. Chris, I'll, I apologize on names. Chamness? Yes, sir. Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Sharon Burton, Commissioner, and Christy Labus, KHP Actuary Representative for AON. Yes, she's on Zoom. Very yeah. good. Checking to make it sure. Um, now, although I've said that, that's on the agenda. Will each of you introduce yourselves for the record, please, including the one appearing remotely? Okay. L Lindy Casebeard, Deputy Secretary, Personnel Cabinet. I'm Sharon Burton. I'm a Commissioner of the Department of Employee Insurance. Chris Chamness. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Employee Insurance. And Christy, Christy Labus, an actuary with Aon. Thank you very much. Will each of you raise your right hands and you swear or affirm to tell the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I do. Thank I you. Do. Thank you. Please proceed briefly, and then okay. we'll get a couple of questions, and we should make this fairly brief. All right, Mr. Ch Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thanks for the opportunity to appear before you today. Uh, I'm going to forego my three-page uh, three each uh, introduction of each one of these uh, fine individuals, but just to say that uh, uh, Sharon Burton became commissioner on, the, on October 1st, as Chris became deputy commissioner on October 1st, and we're, we're thrilled to death to have them in the personnel cabinet. Uh, they, Sharon's been there for many years, and Chris has been there a couple of years, and we're glad that they were appointed and moved up uh, with the departure of our former commissioner. But um, I will turn it over to them because they've got some interesting and enlightening information for you. And, and we have a number of background slides um, that, that we're just going to skip through, mindful of time. But if there are any questions on those slides, by all means, please feel free to ask us. Um, and I'll pass it to the commissioner. So, so we wanted to, to keep this slide in because what this slide depicts is um, how the KEHP utilizes its trust fund dollars. And as you can see, 95.8% of trust fund dollars go to pay medical claims, pharmacy claims, and health reimbursement account claims. Um, for prescription um, administration expenses and medical administration expenses collectively, that amounts to 3.7%, while the Department of Employee Insurance operating expenses are 0.5%, and that's a, a fifth of a penny for every KEHP dollar that's spent. Um, we, we can skip to the COVID slide. Um, and so I think this is probably where you want to be and what you want to hear about. But this slide, basically, KEHP is on the rebound from COVID. Um, I think we all remember that doctor's offices shut down for a period there and you couldn't go, but we are on the rebound with that. However, we are still um, experiencing COVID expenditures. And this slide basically just is a cumulative COVID expenditure chart as of October 18th of 22. And we have experienced $192 million in COVID expenses to that date. Um, we were over a period of months uh, through the height of COVID, our COVID expend expenditures were about $10 million per month. We, they started going down to around five to six million June, July, and August of this year. But we did experience a significant increase in September, so it went back up to 10.5 million. We don't have October data completed yet, but it looks like it might be going down from, from that again. And so at, at, at that, I will turn it over to Christy to kind of talk about what the, the claims trends are looking like and what the rebound is looking like and what we may be expecting for 23 and 24. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, again, Christy Labus with Aon for the record. So if we take a look at this slide, what you're looking at is your incurred claims trend from a historical perspective, 2018, 2019, you can see our trending upward, typical of what we have been seeing pre-COVID. 
And then you'll see the large dip, as Sharon articulated in 2020 there, especially on the medical paid claim side, and that is due to all the shutdowns, lockdowns, et cetera. You'll then see a drastic material rebound in 2021, and that is due to everything opening back up, folks getting comfortable again with seeing doctors, um, again, going and getting those outpatient surgeries and such that they held off on, et cetera. We then jump into year-to-date 2022, which is certainly upward trending as well as we saw in 21, but, but not to the degree of 21, which was more of a rebound year. If we want to advance a slide, 13, what we have here is the post-COVID rebound that I was mentioning on the prior slide. You can see here that we certainly saw on the total medical row, that last row, 2020 compared to 2019 was a large reduction, significantly driven by utilization. And if I take a step back, what impacts trend is unit cost of services as well as utilization of those services. And you'll see the majority of the driver in trend in the 2020 compared to 2019, as well as as you look into 2021 over 2020, Utilization is the main driver in the drop we observed during the COVID year and the rebound that we observed in 2021. We wanna to advance to the next slide. I wanna to touch on a couple key insights as it relates to <gasps> medical trends specifically. So medical trend is certainly as the group has been commenting, there are macroeconomic impacts that are certainly going to come into play on medical trends. We continue to see upward pressures as it relates to medical trend. Again, keying in on that unit cost and the utilization, we've, we have a couple categories here we want to focus on as we think about medical trends. We have chronic conditions. The spending around chronic conditions, especially as it relates to long-term COVID patients, um, those who delayed services or have prevented themselves from going and seeking care and the impact that will have long term is certainly going to have an impact on trends. We see a new normal that we're calling this after COVID-19. We absolutely are seeing an increase in the embracing of the use of telehealth services, helping to lower those professional spend. If you think about going to visit a doctor virtually as opposed to brick and mortar visits, while we do see the expansion of this and the services are, are here to stay beyond uh, the COVID year, it's certainly not expected to drive a major reduction in the overall claim. There's a significant growth in the demand for behavioral health services that stems from the pandemic. However, those costs comprise of a small subset compared to what we're looking at in an overall medical spend. Next up was not new to this, this group, inflation. Uh, Economy-wide inflation is definitely going to drive up wages in the healthcare sector, in turn, drive up negotiated prices that we see with the carriers. It will take a few years for that to come into play. Uh, those contracts are every three to five years, typically. They're not done on an annual basis, so that impact on trends is going to be observed over the, the future. Um, we do expect to continue to monitor the medical claims as, as well as the provider negotiation frequently just to be able to equip and work and partner with the KEHP team. If we jump ahead to the, to the next slide, I'll pivot to pharmacy trends. Again, nothing new here. Certainly upward pressure continues on the pharmacy trend. Some key areas are specialty drugs. Utilization and inflation of these drugs are the primary drivers of overall uh, prescription drug trends. The utilization and the inflation of traditional brand as well as generic drugs is definitely expected to moderate in the range of 2 to 7% over the near future. If we jump to the traditional drugs, we're looking at not a material impact of the traditional uh, brand drugs moving to generic into 2023 and beyond, uh, as well as the generic dispensing rates hitting the low 90% range. That is typical of what we see in the marketplace. Regulation absolutely has an impact on pharmacy trends, as, as we all know, and we've seen the, in the newspapers. 
Anticipation of FDA continuing to approve significant numbers of expensive specialty meds, primarily is, is provider infused, injected. Think about the, the gene therapy um, drugs as well. Over the next several years, that will absolutely, that pipeline have an impact on the cost of pharmacy trends going forward. If we wanna to advance to the next slide, here we have our plan year 2024 projections for you all, this is what Aeon works on. I do want to let the group know that we work continuously with the KEHP staff on these projections. We review them quarterly to continue to monitor the plan experience as the year progresses. What you see here are the first two reviews of just the 2022 plan year itself. As of March, which means we had data through March of 2022, and then the last row there is with data through June of 2022. You'll see left to right what you're looking at are some of the assumptions. First is the employee increase. And you can see that those numbers for 2023 as well as 2024 are 0%. The employer increase for 23 is assumed to be 10%. And for 2024, 16 and a half percent as passed by the budget bill. You can see on the far right, the operating if, if might, let, me, let me interrupt you right there. That gets really Absolutely. to the crux of what we're after uh, is this. Uh, the budget bill actually had a 10% increase in 23 and a 10% increase in 24 in, the, uh, in this item based on the information we received from the executive branch. But it looks like now the um, anticipation is a 16.5% increase in 24 not a 10 percent which leaves us at a shortfall of e if it holds of either uh, modifying benefits increasing cost or something else uh, i'm wondering who has identified that issue um, and what are we doing about it or what are we thinking is going to happen we think prices are going to come down and inflation is going to relax and that 16 is going to fall back to 10 or how are we going to deal with the budgetary shortfall that's already written in uh, based on recommendations. So what we've been advised is that what was passed was the 10% and the 16.5%. So it seems, and so that's what we've built our yeah. assumptions on. If there is a, a, a discord between what was actually passed and what we're using as assumptions, it seems like that is something we definitely need to get to the bottom of, of course. Very good. So for the moment, let's assume for conversation, it's a 10 and 16 and a half and we're on track. Okay. okay. Budgeted to that amount, and we're proceeding that way. Um, is there anything that anyone sees actuarially or otherwise that would throw us higher than 16.5% and 24? Or are we still on track with estimates? Christy, can you speak to that? This is this is Christy Latest for the record. We are on track. All right. Um, with the 16.5%, to be clear. On track. Uh, any possibility that's going to come down, or it's on track? It is on track. As indicated here, we continuously review the projection, Chairman, and what we look at here, you can see the pivot from March to June. When we get additional data, we will look at this at September. We will look at this at year end. As of today, with data through June, we are on track. Very good. Would you mind keeping us pretty well updated on that? And we will update you back on whether 10 or 16 and a half or something else was what was built into the budget so we can make sure that we're all planning for the same scenarios. Absolutely. That work? Absolutely, Very yes. good. Anything else? No, I think that'll do it for Perfect. us. Perfect. And, and did I hear correctly, October 1? October 1, yes. Wow, October 1? Yes. For someone else also, two of you started in? Yes. Wow, well, welcome aboard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very good, thank y'all very much. Next up, we have Airport Noise Mitigation Tax Credit Proposal. Representative Jeff Donahue, if you will come up to the table. And even though I've said it, will you introduce yourself for the record? Make sure that the microphone is sufficiently close and the really bright green light is on. Uh, I'm State Representative, uh, Kentucky State Representative Jeff Donahue, District 37. And Representative Donahue, will you raise your right hand? You swear or affirm to tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth. I always do. Very good. Will you please, and I will take that as an affirmative, so if you will please 
give us an overview of what your proposal is. First of all, thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you all, the fellow legislators. Uh, this has been around for a long time. I'll just give you the cliff notes. You see it on your uh, screen there, it's just a map of what they call the noise corridor. And what we're talking about here is that we want to try to get some kind of a tax break for folks. Uh, it's about a 17 mile, 17.4 mile uh, square area where we have uh, noise issues. And through this corridor here, you can't move the planes. Every time you move the planes from takeoffs, it affects somebody else. So, so this has been identified probably 20 something years ago. So what we're, what we're looking at is this is that what you have is uh, when the airplanes take off from where they from the airport, they fly towards Fort Knox. And what there is, there's a restricted airspace there. So you, you've got to turn, okay? If they flew right by, the folks wouldn't be an issue. But you have UPS up there, which is a very uh, valuable um, private partnership up there with us in the city of Louisville. And, uh, and in the evenings, you have um, 260 uh, events, which are either 130 takeoffs and 130 landings. And they start about 2 o'clock in the morning. And what happens is the thrust. Once they take off and they turn the thrust, it'll, it, it's unbelievable to rattle your homes, these folks' homes. And then when they also um, come in as well, too, in the landing. So what we're asking for is this, and it's been around for a long time. I'm the second person to carry this bill. So what we're doing, we're looking at is a five-year, um, reaching out for five-year with a sunset clause. At the original bill, was like $1.5 million. And what you do is there'd be so much money we give to folks uh, in per household if they invested the soundproofing in the house. It's kind of like putting up a sound barrier wall on the interstate or something like that. And then also money to the uh, uh, business as well in that, in that district. So it's somewhere between 9,000 9, to 10,000 people that it affects, okay? And so what happened is that with the five years, what you would do is that they could apply for this. He'd have to purchase the soundproofing material and stuff, and then we'd be given tax break and, and with the sunset clause in five years. And also what I would like to do, propose, but this is all up to subject to change as well, too, um, it, um, is I'd like to have a five-year look back, same amount of money, not adding any money, but, well, it's only five years, the three million would be available. But originally, we would start out to look back five years to people who have already made that investment. Uh, so it wouldn't be something that's detrimental to them. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, in, the, in the paperwork that was sent to me is that this affects um, not only the district that I'm in, but it affects uh, in the House, it, it affects in, uh, District 19, 33, 35, 38. And, and, and uh, I mean, the House is 37, 35, 40, 41, 42, 46, and 26. And I mentioned the other ones in the Senate. So this is something we can all collaborate and work in collaboration to help these folks out there. I think it's much needed. It's been going on, you know, uh, with the uh, airport, with the increase of flights, which I think is wonderful because it's great for us and the economy in, in Louisville and across the state as well, too. And there's some other statistics I can give you um, that I don't want to bore you with that. But uh, I would really, I'm really thankful for the opportunity to come and speak with each and every one of you. I would like for us as we move forward in this next session to see what we can do to help those folks. Because we get phone calls um, every every other day about what's going to wakes folks up. And these are hardworking individuals who get up every morning. Sometimes if, if you're ever in that position, I remember when I was a kid growing up, we had a train behind our, our property, you know, about four. And it just go clickety-clack, you know, it puts you to sleep, you know. But that plane when that, and that boom that you hear when it, that thrust noise comes out, it wakes you up and it's very difficult for kids to go back to sleep. It's very difficult for folks that are working to go back to sleep. And so we can't do anything about it. I'm trying to help at the nighttime when it comes in, these people are trying to rest. It's really caused a lot of issues in those areas. Now, I've had a conversation with uh, and worked with uh, Representative uh, Weber and also I've spoke with uh, the chairman as well, too, about trying to move this legislation forward. So I thank you for the opportunity. I'll take any questions. Uh, and I look for your partnership and help move this forward. Thank you very much. Uh, really quickly, an estimate. Uh, so what's the, what would be the total maximum uh, fiscal uh, risk to the state or impact to the state? Well, what we talked about, there's only 10,000 homes right there. So initially what it was, it was like 5,000 per house and then 50,000 per whatever private entity. But what I'm asking for is $3 million to be available or until it's exhausted, you know, within that five-year span because we don't want to miss anybody. And that would be for residential and commercial? Residential and commercial. Okay. And it would only, it would be localized to um, areas in and around Jefferson County affected by that air structures. And right here, this is a flight pattern. This is a plan, 17.4 square miles. This is the area right here. No one else would qualify, just these folks that are in that district. Are you aware of any other issue like this across the Commonwealth? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. 
Now, let me say this, Chairman, if I may. We, we've been working on this for years. We have an airpoint noise mitigation uh, group in Louisville, and we've tried to work on a national level. And when you're dealing with federal government, you know things move slowly. And uh, so we've got the Pilot Association that's been working with us. And a lot of times what happens, if I may say this, in California they have a program that's called Get Them Up High. And as soon as they take off, they climb as fast as they possibly can. Okay, and so we, we don't have the ability to do that. And a lot of times in Louisville, what happens, is, and, and when I love it when the pilots got involved, because as soon as they clear the, the, the tarmac and, and they ask for permission to turn, you know, because they want to get set and they put it on autopilot and they fly, you know, so that's where we get a lot of that thrust from. And another thing that comes into play as well, too, is the weather. If it's overcast, there's clouds and stuff, it affects the way it comes, a certain way the wind is blowing, and it also shifts those airplanes a little bit. But the only thing I'm concerned about what's is on this map. Are you aware of any other uh, tax credits or financial assistance to this area relative to this issue? No. Okay, so this is a, a proposal that's been around for a while. There's yes. no alternative that has been applied no. in part. Okay, just making sure. Representative Raymond, question, comment? Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question. So in, uh, in my new district territory, I've picked up Airpoint complaints for the first time um so i know how big of a problem it is i oh i want to tell you what the complaints sound like a little bit here's a message from a constituent you get these i know constantly mm -hmm. the ups airplanes have been flying over the top of my house for the last three hours solid it's 5 19 p.m <clears throat> my windows are rattling and the pictures rattle on the wall the cookie tan on top of my refrigerator is rattling Friday evening, I dozed off on my couch and was awakened when the couch started vibrating and the pictures on the wall started rattling. It's like living in a war zone. This woman signs off sincerely going nuts on Parkway Drive. So uh, I, I know that sometimes people hear about these problems or they hear about mm -hmm. loud bars uh, mm -hmm. on another street that I represent and they say, well, why did you move there? Or why don't you mm -hmm. move away? And we know that it can be hard for people to relocate, mm -hmm. but I wanted to ask you, Representative Donahue, to talk about how the problem has, has started to encompass different people. Because when the airport expanded, there were some provisions. I don't know if it was the city or the airport mm -hmm. that, that provided some financial assistance for folks to mm -hmm. noise guard their homes. But as e-commerce has grown and UPS has grown in Louisville, the problem, the noise has expanded a little mm -hmm. bit. The radius of the noise has expanded. Would you speak to that? Well, what's happened is that a lot of people invest like the Eastern Parkway, which is not my district, you know. People have reimbursed, and there's been a resurgence of those communities out there. And what's happened is a lot of people invested in those homes. They're wonderful, beautiful homes. And when this plan first started, about 30 years ago, when they started changing things in Louisville Airport, they never first, they, matter of fact, they moved subdivisions, to be honest with you, because of the flight path uh, there. And so what happened, they never anticipated what would happen. The planes have gotten bigger, more and more commerce going on, so that's really a big issue. So giving these people the sound of rest in the evening is what we have to work forward to look forward to so um what happens is that just a reinvestment in community because you every one of us here where i live in my area i, I could live anywhere but i love the neighborhood i live in and i'm not going to move and matter of fact on a personal note 30 years ago when they decided to build new runways it actually used to come over my house and i experienced the whole same thing these folks did too but but just moving the new runways what you did like yeah, it, it i don't have any issues anymore Every now and occasionally, depending on what the weather is, is, I do have some flights over, but I'm not the person that I'm trying to help here. So that's what's happened is that these folks, get, uh, you can stand in somebody's yard, you can't even speak it so loud. And we can't stop it, but we can sure give them rest in the evening time. Very good. Uh, Representative Hale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Representative Donahue. Uh, and I, I can, I, of course, I don't live close to an airport, but my son lives in Nashville. And it's, it happens to at his house. Uh, he's very close to the airport and it happens at his house. But my question is, has there been studies done that people actually put these, uh, uh, whatever you're talking about, putting into these homes, does that, does that actually cut down the noise? It, it, it does. It does. And what's happened, if I may say this, some people have already done That's why I said I want to have a five-year look back, okay? Some people have went in and insulated their homes and they put a soundproofing windows, believe it or not. Technology has really caught up soundproofing doors. It's amazing. You step in the home, you can't even hear it. Now, the vibration and stuff like that, depending on where they're at, I can't stop that. Well, we can't stop that. But we can sure give them a piece so of it. So it actually is a, it pretty actually effective. It does work. And the only reason I increased the, the original bill was $1.5 million. The only reason I said we need, we need to move up, like if our previous presentation was made because of cost. You know, things that cost. I've done some, you know, remodeling at my home, and it's amazing what regular windows just cost versus soundproofing windows. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Thank you very much. 
Thank you for the presentation. Thank you all. I'll get the lights. Appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. Oh, we're not finished yet. Now, um, I will do want to make an announcement. Uh, well, first, correspondence received on the agenda eight and nine. Uh, feel free to inquire Jennifer Hayes and inquire of Jenny Bannister regarding those. They're always um, invigorating reading. Uh, and then I want to do, uh, I do want to make this announcement. Uh, there was a report that was due on November the 1st. 2022 from the personnel cabinet so as required by house bill one the personnel cabinet secretary has performed a review of krs chapter 18a the merit system and provided a report and recommendations for changes to the merit system the report was received on november 1st in compliance with the budget bill language and was also submitted to the interim joint committee on state government which i very much appreciated because that is the committee of jurisdiction that would take up this issue for consideration um, I'm also asking that staff uh, provide a copy of this report and recommendations to each member on this committee so you will have it in case someone inquires. Anything else? Thank you all. We are adjourned. <laughs>